subscribe please like share subscribe and thank you very much for watching i really appreciate your time peace out all right let's let's do this shit i'm here today with will the kill choke arguably the most busiest man in um, fight sports uh what is it let me see what i got correct me if i'm wrong 38 and 16 mma record uh, 40, uh, well, 40 and six, man, for some reason, they don't got two of my wins on there. When I, I actually fought in Malaysia with soccer, uh -huh. kick and roll, like it was like the most oh, freestyle no. fight I've ever fought. But because uh -huh. we were hard and we had to do this whole, it was a, a it was called one slot. There was this big slot tournament, but it was actually just freestyle MMA. But uh, two of those wins are not on there. It kind of okay, so 40 and 60. <laughs> Max Holloway in the UFC. Turned mm. pro in 2010 MMA. Yeah. And I, I couldn't even find other things. I know you fought bare knuckle boxing, left way, Muay Thai, <laughs> kickboxing. You named it, you fought it, haven't you? So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just fight anything because, like, I don't want to work a real job. Like, I refuse to work a real job. So, <laughs> and I wanted to make my money fighting. And I was like, so if I really was going to do that, I couldn't just be an MMA fighter. I couldn't just be a Muay Thai fighter. I had to be diverse and take anything that I was offered because if I want to get paid and make my actual living fighting, I got to be a, be flexible and fight everything. So, yeah, that was the main reason for that. Yeah. So, what have you, what have you got coming up now? You said you got a fight in Florida. Yeah, yeah. So, I got a fight. Uh, it was supposed to be June 26th for BKFC, Bare Knuckle, Bare Knuckle Boxing again. Uh -huh. uh, it's going to be in Southern Florida here in Tampa. Tampa, Florida, uh, which is only a couple hours from where I'm staying. Now I'm staying right next to Daytona Beach. Um, oh, nice. But, um, yeah, it's awesome here, actually. I was in Idaho for almost like a month, and I was going crazy. <laughs> but, uh, but no, nah, Florida's not so bad. But, um, and everything, I everything like, in Daytona. Yeah, Daytona's nice. Um, I, last time I was in Daytona was when I was in high school, so it's cool to be back in Florida. Because my entire adult life I've been over in Asia, and so – so, yeah. yeah, but um, I was supposed to fight Bare Knuckle BKFC June 26th, but they postponed the show to July 24th. And uh -huh. uh, the reason they postponed it is because they'll be allowed to have the live audience then. So it won't uh -huh. be like a crowdless yeah. show. So, so yeah, that should be really, that should be a lot of fun. So looking forward so, to it. So that, that's, you haven't got anything in between then? Nah, like it's funny. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, the world's busiest combat fire. Like I was last year, <laughs> but, you know, ever since COVID, you know, there's been, What's funny is I had three fights in December. My last fight was December 22nd. I, I have not went this uh, long without a fight. Like, since I made my pro debut, I never went this long without a fight. But, uh, yeah, that's just yeah, the whole world. This must be killing 20. you. No, nah, it is. It's making me – I'm going nuts. My wallet's not liking it. I'm not liking it. My <laughs> wife's not happy. Uh, I'm not happy. But, uh, but hey, it's, it's just 2020 has been a crazy year with this whole COVID and just – everything that's been going on it's been because you were stuck yeah. in singapore weren't you what happened yeah, so at the end of march is when like things started getting like coronavirus started uh, leaving china and kind of getting crazy and uh singapore already got some cases and then uh they started like getting strict right at the end of the march and so my the gym i was working at, i was coaching in singapore that it, it uh it closed down because because of covid and so I wasn't working at, so I had, but I had to wait until April 2nd to get my last paycheck. Uh -huh. Cause uh, I was, I was like, all right, the gym's closed. I'm going to go to Thailand, but I had to wait to get my last paycheck. Uh -huh. And okay. So I waited to April 2nd cause I would have went to Thailand and at the end of March, the border for Thailand was still open, but I got paid April 2nd. I was going to go to Thailand. The border closed uh -huh. and, like, and I missed it by like just a couple of days. And uh -huh. was, uh, that, that, that really sucked. And then, so, yeah, I was like, okay, I guess I can try to wait this out. I'm like, how long could this really last? They're really going to close down the whole world because of a fucking flu? I was like, <laughs> yeah. Uh... yeah. that's. I was like, no way they're going to shut down everything. And even if they do shut it down for a couple couple weeks, it's like, I was like, oh, it'll be a couple weeks. But anyway, so I was in Singapore the whole, like a month, basically, under, under like strict lockdown. Like, I couldn't leave leave uh, my where I'm staying unless – Let's add a mask on. You can't meet anybody outside. And Singapore's crazy for finding everybody. Like, they'll find you mm -hmm. for this, they'll find you for that. If you're caught outside without a mask, you'll get a fine. If you're caught outside 
with somebody that you don't live with, you're going to get a fine or, or you can get kicked out of the country or I can get blacklisted because I'm a foreigner there. So, um, and yeah, so the borders weren't going to open up. I, I it seemed like shit was getting crazier and stricter and I was watching the news and reading all this conspiracy theory shit. And I was just like, oh, fuck this. I got to leave. I got to leave. I can't, I can't stay here. And then, uh, yeah, no, no other borders would, were open, even Indonesia and, and uh, Laos, Cambodia. Not, no, nobody, all the borders are closed. So, so I went back to America. And so, yeah, that's, that's a, that's, uh, I was in Idaho for, for like a month. I went crazy in Idaho because my family <laughs> lives in a small town of like 8,000 people. Idaho, by the way, is probably one of the most racist states I've ever been in. Everybody thinks the uh -huh. South is racist, like Texas or Alabama, yeah. but nah. The Midwest, these random little Midwestern states that are small and have small populations that's predominantly white, those states are much more fucked up than, <laughs> than the South. But yeah, so I got the opportunity to come here to Florida to this gym called Marshall Fitness, and uh, they asked if I would like to coach. That Everything's open in Florida now. The gyms are open. And I was like, oh, yes, 100%. Sign me up. I'll, I'll come tomorrow. The, the, the owner bought my ticket, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm here now. So, yeah. <laughs> Wicked, you know. Um, you said something to me about they had an app in Singapore or something about say, COVID. Say, they had an app in Singapore about COVID or something. You uh -huh. were saying to me. Fuck, when I was in Singapore, I was like, this Singapore is such a crazy country. Like, it's a city, but it's a city country um, hmm. for the people listening. And it's, it's so strict. The people, like, are so I, – I honestly, I, I was just straight up say they're brainwashed by their government. Everybody like reports, like they'll report you for anything. You're doing something wrong. Everybody seems really friendly and nice, but they're so like what that goes on in their head and, and uh, what, how what they'll report you online or talk shit online about foreigners or like, what's funny is uh, a lot of times when I'm living in Singapore, I'll see videos online of like uh, of Singaporeans taking videos of somebody like, let's say uh, somebody groped somebody in the, in the subway or the MRT. Yeah. Uh, they'll they'll stay quiet, take a little video, but nobody will actually speak up and say something to the person. But they'll take <laughs> videos and shame the person online, and like, but um, so in in while I was in Singapore during this COVID stuff, uh, yeah. the government released this app where where uh, citizens can snitch on each other and report each other to the local authorities if they're caught outside without a mask, if they're caught outside mingling with with somebody that they don't live with. Um, they can report the, the, like, and they, and the government encourages people to snitch and be and, and like report and everybody's like, Oh, I'm going to be a good citizen. And there's a bunch of terrible videos that actually happened where, where guys were going outside and trying to film people who weren't wearing a mask and shame them and talk ah. shit. And it was just like, it was ridiculous. I was like, yo, fuck this place. I got I'm. I was like, whatever, I'm going back to the land of the free. I know America's crazy right now, like on the media and on the news, but. Yeah, there's two million cases apparently, supposedly, if we if you believe the numbers, but everything's normal here. Like Disneyland is back open, <laughs> all the it? gyms are open, the restaurants, are, yeah, Dis all the amusement parks, Universal Studios, Disneyland, all the amusement parks in Florida are back open. Like nobody wow. gives a fuck here, and if you just stay I, off, it's the, the opposite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you stop watching the news and stuff, like. America is really not that bad. Like I'm here in Florida, and there's nothing going on. Everything seems pretty. Every, everybody's pretty chill in the city that I live in right now. Then, yeah. <laughs> of course, if you watch the news though, or you watch uh, social media, it seems like everybody's racist and anti-cop, and there's riots and protests. Which there are in some cities. There are some riots and protests, but uh -huh. I don't know. There's nothing going on here though. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like Florida's just got a different totally different spin to a lot of the rest of America. Like I, I've been to Florida a few times, but uh, from, from what everything people say, it's just like, it's not the same. Yeah. We got the beach. We got like, like there's no, there's no racism here. People are pretty chill. And <laughs> there's, it's funny, like Florida has rednecks. Like, that's like a misconception. Like people think Miami and Orlando, Disneyland, there's a lot of rednecks in Florida, but the rednecks here are super chill. They just like guns and, <laughs> and then, uh -huh. yeah, they're just like guns and the big trucks and shit. But everybody's pretty yeah. normal here. <laughs> yeah, my friends, my friends used to have a place, or they have a place in Destin, and they call that like the Redneck Riviera. <laughs> and I, and I, I, had a, I had a nice time there; it was really cool. 
Uh, where are so you now? Are you, still, are you still in South America? Yeah, I'm stuck in Peru. It's it's real wow. draconian here as well. It's, it's lightened up a little bit, but there was a time where I could only go out. Men could go out Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Women, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. No one wow. on a Monday. A Sunday, maybe. Oh, but now I can go out every day apart from Sunday. Sunday, you can't go out. So it's Jesus. still bad. I want, I want to get out now. Yeah, that's so crazy. Peru is a pretty chill country, though. Like, how was it before the whole COVID stuff? Or did you have a good time, Elise, before that? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've just been cycling through Peru, really. So I haven't spent a lot of time here because I've just been coming down the coast and there's not a lot in this area. So yeah. I got to this city and I thought, I'll spend a week here. And then, <laughs> locked down. And I, I just booked the flight back to Thailand because I thought they were going to close the borders. And then... It's like, no, flight's yeah. gone. Oh, no. It's about four days out from my flight and I couldn't get, it, get out of it. And, you know, so, Are they going to reimburse you, though? Will they reimburse yeah, the flight? Yeah, I got some money back on that one, yeah. So, yeah. It's, oh, not, okay. it's not been good. All right, I good, didn't good. expect it to be this long. So, well, I was yeah. thinking of fact. No, but... Yeah. How oh, did you ahead. get into fighting? Because you were, you were in the services, weren't you? And then left the services. Did you were you fighting in the services, or did you get out and then start fighting? No. Well, I, I graduated high school when I was seventeen, and you can join the U.S. military as long as you have a high school diploma or a GED. You can uh -huh. you can join at seventeen, and so I joined, and I was only in two years. I got a I got discharged. I had like, you know, I was married when I was young and had problems in domestics and. Things. So I got uh -huh. discharged I had, uh, for, for like past mistakes and stuff. And so when I was 19, I was like, fuck, I just got kicked out of the military. Uh, I don't want this like mistake or like that I did to define me for the rest of my life. It, I was like, I, especially, yeah, I was like, I, I was poor. Like my, my family is like lower middle class. Like I won't uh -huh. say we're poor, but we're low income. Like I'm not going to be affording college or get student loans. I had bad grades in high school and stuff like that. So I got kicked out of the military. I'm not going to go to college. I don't have a trade. So I was like, fuck, what am I going to do? I was just like, I'm not going to – I don't want to stay in, in America and work some shitty job and just, you know, follow my ex-wife around trying to be around my daughter and just let mm -hmm. her to kind of dictate my life and stuff. And I was like, no, nah, fuck this. I'm going to be selfish. You know, I tried to join the, the military to be a good man and take care of my family and be, like, be married. I married right out of high school. Cause I thought it was the right, like in my head, I thought that was the right thing to do. Yeah, but yeah, I, know. yeah, I was young and immature, whatever. Cause so I got out of the military and when I was 19, I was stationed in Guam for a year. I was in Guam. So this little Pacific Island in the middle of the, or, or little Island in the middle of the Pacific ocean, um, which is mm -hmm. not too far from the Philippines. One third of the Island is like Filipino. What's funny is I lived in the Philippines. So I can, I really compare Guam and the Philippines a lot cause it's pretty similar, uh -huh. but, um, but I always knew about Thailand and I knew about Muay Thai and I knew about Tiger Muay Thai. And I, um, I was like, hell oh, fuck this. I'm just going to use, I had, had some money saved up from, from military when I got, when I got discharged. So I was like, I'm just going to use this money and go to, go to Thailand and see what happens. I'm going to try to be a fighter. I'm just going to, just going to go and try to be a fighter. Didn't really have much training experience. I, I trained a little bit. I got in a lot of street oh. fights. I was a real angry kid. But I didn't, I didn't really uh -huh. train a lot before that. Um, and then I just bought a bought a one way ticket, and then uh, that was that. And then, yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah. So, so how did you get into MMA then? Well, okay. So the whole story about him, how I knew about MMA and why I was always always a huge fan of fighting is my uh, my my dad. Uh, he went to high school with Kenny Shamrock. They went to the same high school and from okay. the same town. Cool. We're from uh -huh. Susanville, California, in Northern California, and. Uh, yeah, so, like, when I was a little kid, even in the 90s, like, as early as I remember, like, 93, 94, with my dad, I'd be watching, uh, we'd be watching Ken Shamrock fight, like, oh, Kenny's fighting, Kenny's fighting, we got to watch him fight, you know, back in the early UFCs. I knew about uh -huh. Pride in the 90s, way before anybody really knew about about Pride, you know, I'm like, eight, nine years yeah. old, watching, trying to, like, learn about, you know, just following Kenny's career, because that was like the big star of my, you know, my dad's, my dad's school. So yeah, mm -hmm. I became like, I was like a super fan of UFC. I followed UFC. I remember back in the day when I was in high school before the ultimate fighter, 
I used had yeah. the VHS tapes of all the like the first thirty UFCs my dad on, had on VHS, and mm -hmm. uh, I would pop them in and be like, guys, come on, I'm gonna show you some cool shit. I'm gonna show you no holds barred fighting, you know. Back when it was called like no holds barred, it wasn't really called MMA. Yeah. And uh, and then yeah, we'd watch fights and stuff like that. And this is man, back when I in high school, that was like when Kimbo started getting big in Florida. Had the so I went to high school in Florida, and uh, you know there are street, you know there's like those the, the street fights and YouTube was getting big, and uh, and then and then boom, what's funny is I showed my friend all the VHS tapes, and he's like, oh bro, he's like, bro, do you see do you see the commercials on Spike TV? The Ultimate Fighter is coming out, uh, like uh, there's gonna be a UFC reality show, and I was like, what the fuck? And then I was like, oh shit, but it was kind of cool, like. I showed all my friends these VHS tapes before this reality show came out. So that was kind of cool. And, uh, uh -huh. and I don't know, for some reason I was like, I was a dumb kid. I was like 19. And I just, when I got out of the military, I thought for sure, like I watched some fights before live and I always thought I could do it. I was like, ah, I could do that. That's no problem. <laughs> I, that looks, I'm not going to say it looks easy, but uh, man, I can fight. I can fight, you know? So, <laughs> so, so that's what made me like want to go over and just fight. I was like, fuck this. I'll, I'll do this. I think I'd rather be a fighter than, like you say, work some fast food job, work at a grocery store mm -hmm. or something. So I was like, yeah. so that's why. <laughs> so, so you went went to Thailand, started fighting Muay Thai, then came back and started fighting MMA. Oh, oh, what's funny is I, um, I think I went over to Thailand in April 2010, uh -huh. and I had my first uh, my first fight. I fought amateur MMA for the Tiger Muay Thai beatdown. I, I, it was funny as I, I booked a Muay Thai fight and uh, and then I saw that there was I could sign up for an MMA fight because you can just sign up at Tiger, at Tiger Muay Thai to sign up on mm -hmm. their barbecue beatdown. And I signed up to fight as well. And it was, the, the, the amateur fight was three days before my actual first Muay Thai fight. But I was like, yeah, whatever. I don't care. All the Thais, they fight all the time. So in my head, I'm like this young, naive kid just thinking that, oh, that's it's okay. It's normal here to fight you know, mm -hmm. two, three times in a week. It's not a big deal. I used to watch the the old UFCs where they had the tournaments. They fight two, three times in a night. So I was like, I didn't really think it was a big deal until everybody made it seem like it was such a big deal. <laughs> but I fought the amateur MMA fight. I won. And then I won my Muay Thai fight three days later. What was funny is four days after my, my Muay Thai fight, there was another Muay Thai fight open because uh, one of the Tiger Muay Thai guys, the guest, he pulled out of his yeah. fight and they asked me to replace uh -huh. him. So I was like, boom, I fought three times, like within a period of 10 days. And that's wow. how I started fighting, you know? So I was just like, it just became normal for me. And then um, I got a few more Muay Thai fights. And I, like my, my Muay Thai record started out kind of 50-50. And then, uh, and then I, I found out that there were some promoters in Taiwan. Um, and they were looking for, looking for fighters. And I tried it. I messaged the promoter. I found out who the promoter was. I added them on Facebook. Just send them. My, my cool little videos of my amateur video, my amateur fight at Tiger, and I sent him some of my, my pictures and fights and when I fought Muay Thai and just asked him to fight. I just hounded him, hounded him. And then I made my pro debut against this Korean, and I wasn't ready for it, <laughs> and I really wasn't that good. <laughs> and then the, the Korean armbarred me in like 90 seconds, and that was my pro debut. <laughs> so, yeah. But, but it was cool. Like, like I was – really fresh in the game i only hit was just started training and i already fought mm -hmm. pro and i was like oh you know my record like my, my muay thai was, was like 50 50 i won I, I won half my fights and i was like for a guy who just started out i, I was like i'm pretty good at this shit <laughs> yeah that's, that's still going especially yeah, exactly. muay thai because fighting really often and getting leg kicks they don't go away quick do they i don't no, know about for no. you but I, you know Oh no! And I was like, oh, I'm still pretty skinny, but I was a whole lot skinnier back then. And getting and everybody just kicked the shit out of my legs. And I just remember always having a sore leg. And I got really good at fighting southpaw because I would just get my lead leg kicked, and then my southpaw leg would get kicked up, and then I would always, <laughs> <laughs> I'd always be switching stances. And yeah, but but I mean, like I was motivated enough because like I was like, all right, I know I'm like lost, and in my head I'm like, I've only been training a couple months, and. But I was motivated enough and like encouraged enough to where I thought I would be pretty good at this if I just did it full time, and so that's what I did, you know. And yeah, haven't haven't really looked back since then. So yeah, it's my, been my life. <laughs>
Um, what was your, what was your road to the UFC then? Oh, well, cause I, same thing though. I was fighting all the time. I, I try to get all the, and, and I started living everywhere. Like I, I lived in, mm -hmm. I lived in Phuket. I've been in Bangkok and then I was in Taiwan and then, uh, I got a chance to go to the Philippines in 2011. I was only going to go for like a month of training. I ended up staying like almost close to a year, uh, like uh -huh. maybe 10 months. And I got really close with this the promotion called the URCC. And, uh, and I was living with a the family there and training there. And uh, I started fighting for the, the URCC in the Philippines, which is the biggest promotion in the Philippines. And I, I, was, I just got on this win streak because um, I started out with my MMA career. I was five and five, five wins, five uh -huh. losses. And then, um, then when I got six and five, boom, that, that like tipped it. And like everything started coming together. I started getting more comfortable in the ring. I started learning more skills, takedown defense, a uh, little bit of jujitsu. And, uh, and I went on a 14 fight win streak. So I got up to 19 and five and mm -hmm. then the UFC signed me at the end of 2013. So I started in 2010 and the end of 2013, I got signed to the UFC and then, and then, yeah, but, but unfortunately, my first fight was Max Holloway, and uh, I fought Max Holloway right after he fought. He lost a decision to Conor McGregor, and uh, so it ended my the, the, that uh, ended my UFC career pretty fast. So yeah, it's a bit rough <laughs> now, now looking at where he's gone to, isn't it? You know what I mean? So because he he said the other day, he mentioned you didn't he on Joe Rogan the other day about that being one of the toughest opponents that he's had to, to yeah. face. Well, yeah. He said it was like one of the toughest fights to prepare for, just because how tall it was. Because back then, like I'm 194 cm or six foot four, and I fight. I used to fight at 145 or 66 kilos, and uh, yeah, I was like I'm the tallest. What's funny is uh, six foot four is the tallest for featherweight, lightweight, and welterweight. There's no welterweight over six four. There's no uh -huh. lightweight over six four, and and I, I set the record for being the tallest featherweight in the world, and. Uh, yeah, he was. I just he just never had a fight because he's pretty tall too. He's like six foot two, and but he never had yeah. a fight a guy taller than him or longer than him. So, yeah, that was, that was interesting. <laughs> what What was that like? What was Was it a big difference? You always hear it. Well, you always hear it when you're watching on TV, octagon jitters and things like that. Did you find it much different, or or was it another yeah, day at the office for you? So I really didn't. I really that was what I thought it was going to be. I thought I was like, ah, oh, I already had because at that time I think I had like. 30 fights or so, or 40 fights, 30, 40 fights. And I was just like, oh, yeah, exactly. Another day in the office, not a big deal, whatever. I have, I had more fights than Max Holloway. So, but the big difference was that like, I was 19 and five, but of all my wins, most of my fights and my wins were against like mid tier MMA fighters. I fought uh -huh. some really good Muay Thai fighters and K1 fighters, but that's not the same as MMA. And um, out of all my wins, I probably fought two like high level guys that, were probably UFC worthy, but Max mm -hmm. Holloway has fought his whole career fighting high level guys, literally from his pro debut up until, up until like I fought him, he was fighting high level guys. And so, and I was winning that first round against them. And I was, I was winning up until like the last 20 seconds of that first round, he kind of clipped me. And every single time I hit him, it did like, he, like usually when I hit guys, you can see their confidence level drop. They get desperate mm -hmm. or or they start panicking. One thing about Max Holloway is he never panicked. He stayed on his game plan. He didn't care. If anything, he got more intense as the fight kept going on. Every 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 uh, minute that passed, he was getting more intense and having more output. But every single time he hit me, my, I was started panicking. I started, you know, I started uh, – my confidence was dropping. And, uh, and uh -huh. like, I was winning the first round, and then I got kind of clipped at the end of the first round. I probably still won the first round on paper, but um, but then I remember sitting in my corner, and then and then like thinking, oh, I have to go, I have to go for a takedown. I got to clinch with them. I got close distance, and I, and then I got really desperate in the second round, and I shouldn't have been. I should have just been cool, calm, and like relaxed, and I should have just kept the game plan, stay long, try to pick them apart, and and not get deterred and not get discouraged just because I was getting hit, because I was hit, outlanding him and hitting him more than he was hitting me, but. Mm -hmm. I got discouraged and that that was a huge lesson for me just realizing oh this is the big leagues you know like and and yeah I think that's like oh, that in, in that regard I think off like the octagon shock or octagon jitters or or UFC yeah. jitters they are they are kind of real because yo know, it's it's a different level it's a di like 
fighting on the regional scene is not the same. Being a big fish in a small pond is not the same as the UFC, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, or I don't know, tell you the truth. I've had two <laughs> amateur fights, and that's that's the, the sum total. And being fifty now, I think that's that's the end of my uh, fighting career. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like, when you fight so often, do you game plan, or do you just? You no, know, most you just spe- like I fight? I fight in China, or if I, I fight a lot of guys I don't know who I'm fighting, or I don't really have a lot of details. I'm real superstitious. I don't like watching, even if I do know who I'm fighting, I don't like watching footage of who I fight. Uh, anytime I watch footage, I feel like I either get way too confident, or I get nervous, or I overthink things. So I don't watch footage. I just go in, I try to test out the first round, and see how it goes, and then from the first round, I'll kind of decide what to do. If I have like an actual team and good good like most of the time i'm training by myself for my fights or like uh i'm at a gym where i'm coaching at and i'm the best guy in the gym or there's not many guys that can like like, there's i'm not like there's not like i have a head coach that follows me everywhere i travel to and stuff and i and i just i don't know i just try to do my best i go in i try to evaluate things use my experience and see how things are going to go and then you know if the guy's really like really slick then maybe i'm going to clinch with this guy maybe i'll try to take him down or Maybe I'll just try to stay standing. I like it. Really, just depends how the that first couple minutes of the fight goes, you know. Uh-huh. So even yeah. like, how about when you're training? You know, it's like because you fight everything, don't you? Really? Uh, yeah. Do you do you do specific training, or do you just pretty much just train and then fight, or like, uh, when yeah, you go bare knuckle? <laughs> yeah, no, What's I just that? train and fight. Like if I'm gonna do bare knuckle next, like I. I will focus more on boxing, but I'm still doing MMA. I still do jiu-jitsu. I'm still rolling with guys. I'm still, I'm still sparring other stuff, doing takedown defense shit. And, but I will make it a point that at least one of my trainings of the day is just boxing or when I hit mitts, I'm only boxing or when I hit the bag, I'm only boxing, you know? Um, Uh So I'll, I'll change it a little bit, but for the most part, I'm just like, as long as I'm running, hitting pads and sparring, I feel like I'll get in great shape and I'll be ready for whoever, Whoever I'm fighting, whatever style I'm fighting, I'll be ready for it, you know? How, how do you manage to keep your weight down? Because you, you know, like, you're six foot four. Like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> Man, my, metabolism. I just like, honestly, I was like, very, I was very lucky to be blessed with a good metabolism. Um, but lately I've been, back in the day, I used to fight featherweight a lot, but the weight cuts, I think my, my first 50 fights were probably at featherweight, over 50 fights, but... <laughs> I was just, it just got too much, make cutting weight all the time. Cause I actually had to cut weight properly to make featherweight and it just got yeah. way too hard. And just, it just, I just couldn't do it. And then even nowadays, like I went to lightweight permanently. And then uh, even nowadays though, making lightweight all the time is kind of a pain in the ass. I can still do it, but you know, I'll have to like, I'll have to make sure at least for the last two weeks before the fights, before weigh-ins, I'm, I'm kind of watching my diet and making sure I'm increasing the cardio and I can make weight. But lately, I've been doing a lot of catch weights. My next fight's at 77 kilo. I'm fighting at 170, and I can make that, like, I can make that tomorrow. You just put me in a sauna can I, tonight. Can I ask what your walk-around weight is? Right now, like, so I've been fluctuating. Like, uh, now that I'm back into training and everything, I've been training the last about month or so. Um, I'm down uh-huh. to 80 kilos again. But, man, okay. just, just before, <laughs> like, when I flew to America, I think I was, like, 85 <laughs> and so on and yeah, yeah 85 I that went up when you were doing barbecues back at home though didn't it yeah but what's funny <laughs> is i thought i was gaining weight when i came to the states but i started and again the gyms were open and uh and now i haven't really gained weight i got down to 80 kilos and to cut three kilos is nothing i can probably like sleep that off and maybe maybe have to go you know go like literally sleep like if i don't eat anything for dinner and i just sleep and wake up and go to the bathroom i might have to go for a light jog and i can lose three kilos so mm-hmm. yeah yeah so so wait wait quick i i only done it once i was grumpy all week i don't, I don't know how you do it it's like when, when, I, when yeah. I restrict my food I, i'm just horrible to be around like <laughs> I, I don't I know like i got too much it just but that like because i've done it so much it just became my life so this became just how i like just how I am. People always ask me, are you, how, how do you just not get injured? Or like, I'm sore all the time. Like even training and mm-hmm. I have old injuries and stuff. I'm sore all the time, but you just I'm like, you just get used to little things like that. Like, but my, my, my diet shocking. I don't really control my diet unless 
unless I'm really cutting a lot of weight. And even still, I'm only going to diet for like two weeks before the fight. I don't, I, I don't understand how some of those fighters do those strict, strict diets for like two months at a time. Ugh, that seems miserable, those calorie deficit diets. They must diets. be cutting a lot of weight though, aren't they? You know? Yeah, like K- Khabib, I heard he goes from like 84, 85 to 70 kilos. And, uh, yeah. and, he, and he's, he's like has very, very little body fat at 85 kilos. So, uh, yeah, I heard some – I don't know. It just seems miserable. I don't want to do that shit either. So, <laughs> so wait, normally you stay in Thailand, don't you? What, what, what do you eat there? Do you eat Thai oh, I just food eat Thai or? food. Yeah, I just eat Thai food all the time. But, I'm like, it's weird. Like, I don't know if this is from the military or maybe growing up as a kid, but I just don't – like, I can eat two th- little Thai meals a day and I can be fine. As long as I got water or some soda. Like, like I, I like – uh. If I got extra money, I'll snack a lot. I'll buy like little junk food and stuff. But when uh-huh. I, if I don't have extra money and stuff, I just, just get it. I just eat real basic local food and, and I'm fine. Like, I'm, I don't know. Like, what's your, your go to food? Uh, oh, um, I don't know. Uh, like crisp, crispy pork. I don't know. Like crispy pork with kale. That's the English. Or I don't know what it's called. Mugam. 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 <laughs> Yeah. Kalmuga. Yeah. Kalmuga. Which is just be pork with rice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I like that. So, <laughs> do you eat sontan? Say again? Do you eat sontan? Yeah, of course, because my wife is from Isan, and, like, my wife ah, is... Okay. My, <laughs> yeah, my wife is... Uh, she eats spicy food for, like... Even Thai people will say her food is too spicy, and she fucking drives me nuts. Because like anytime she does cook for me, yeah, she I swear she tries like, fuck with me and kills. She like I'll be like, yo, nay, like you better put three chili, like more than three chilies in my food. And I swear to God, she'll put five, and she'll fuck with me and and make it more miserable. And <laughs> I remember one time I snapped on her. I was eating my food and I was like sweating. It was delicious. The problem is the food is delicious and it tastes good, even the yeah. spiciness, but. But I remember I fucking snapped. I'm like, nay. I was like, I don't want to fucking fight. I, I was like, I fight in the gym all day. I don't want to get home. When I'm trying to relax, I have to fight my food every fucking day. <laughs> and, I, and I snapped. It is like terrible for spicy, aren't they? Uh, it's, so, it's so spicy. It's like it's outrageous. Have you, so, we've, yeah. we've heard of you got two, is it two daughters? Oh yeah, so so I got I got four kids total. I got one here in America, and I have three in Thailand. So That's with my wife, I, we have uh, two sons and and one girl. Yeah, oh, but okay. but I also have a my my oldest daughter is here in Florida. But yeah, uh huh. Do, do you still speak to her? Or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. So we're I'm supposed to go see her. Like she's hopefully because now that's a live because June twenty sixth was going to be a closed door event, but now that's a live audience event. She'll be able to go to my fight now. Um, after the fight, there's an amusement park that I haven't been to here in Florida. Because I've been to Disney World and Universal. And last time I was in Florida in 2014, I took my daughter to Disney World. So this time I'm going to take her to this other place called Bush Gardens, which is this crazy amusement park here in Florida. I've, I've never been, but I know of it. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, you know Bush Gardens. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I love, uh, Universal Studios is good. I like it there. The, the rides are, are Yeah. Universal is a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, I've been to yeah, the Singapore yeah. Universal, but it's so tiny. But the big, the uh-huh. one in Florida is the, is the best. It's huge. It's way bigger. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that um, the the Spider Man ride there. Have you been on that one? And the and the Double Dragon. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. dueling dragons, and then yeah, yeah all that. Ah, oh, it's cool. Dragons, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you've been to Florida, so I could at least talk to you about this stuff. <laughs> oh, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's it's been oh, about 12, 15 years since I've been in Florida now, but you know. Uh, that's one of those things. Everyone should go if you can afford it to Florida. Yeah. The amusement parks in Florida. It is just unbelievable. Stay on International Drive. The food's cheap there, isn't it? Get you get coupons for everything, and you, you get like, you know, and it it's just amazing. You know, I I love it. That's the misconception. Like people think America is actually like it's expensive to live here. Like the cost of living for like your for your rent, your car insurance, your car payment, all these other little things. Like, it's, it's expensive to live here. But if you're actually just visiting or eating out, even, like, the portions of food is massive portions. And food is, at restaurants is actually relatively cheap. 
Well, especially compared mm. to England. England was outrageous in London. London was so expensive. <laughs> yeah, I'm, London, I'm like, I, when, I was, when I was in London, I was blown away how expensive everything was. I was just like, Jesus Christ. Even Australia. I've been to Australia as well. And Australia is outrageous too. Ugh. Cost. Yeah, it's, it's, it's my, a lot. My last time, <laughs> I think it was about three years ago, I was in the UK. And I was meant to stay a month or six weeks. And I went to the shop, I bought three things, some milk, some something else, and something else. It cost me about 15 quid. I got home, <laughs> booked a flight back to Thailand. <laughs> so I went back to Thailand. I, like, I can't be doing this. It's too expensive. <laughs> I've yeah, seen this everyone. is bullshit. Like, I'm, I'm going yeah, back. Yeah, you know, I was taking the tube, and like I couldn't believe like the the cheapest ride was like five quid, and I was like, yeah. oh. I was like, what? I was like, for one way, for just a one way ride, because I didn't have an Oyster card, and I didn't have these other things, and I was just, and yeah, you know, I went to get a coffee at this little cafe, four quid, and I was just, I'm just converting everything into Thai bot, and I'm going crazy, just like this is outrageous. Yeah. No, <laughs> not good. Uh, <laughs> I think at the other time in London, I decided to go and stay at a friend's house. And by the time I got the train from the airport, the tube, and a taxi, it had been cheaper for me to stay in a hotel by the airport. It's like, wow. <laughs> why have I just done this? It's crazy. <sighs> it was about 80 or 90 pounds that I spent just getting to her house. Yeah, that's yeah. not so, it's too crazy. Yeah, you're, you're doing it smart. Live overseas. Yeah, stay it. <laughs> Even traveling the world, it's, I feel like it's cheaper like, yeah, than living in, in London. Colombia. <laughs> six months in Colombia and six months in Thailand. That I, I'd be over the moon with that one. Is uh, Colombia nice? There. Is it, it? It's not dangerous. Uh, no, oh, it's, it's, <laughs> there in Thailand are the two nicest places I've been. People were so friendly to me there. The food That's isn't awesome. as good, but the, there's just a really nice atmosphere there with people. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. If you can ever get to uh, visit, I'd, I'd just go in like yeah. yeah I, so. I gotta do South America one day, but I like as far as like danger, like Brazil's dangerous, Mexico's dangerous, but uh, but like a lot of people think think Thailand is dangerous. I'm like, no, Thailand is not dangerous, guys. I'm like, you if you find to find trouble, you can find trouble. But really, I was like, Southeast Asia really isn't that dangerous, or compared to like South America at least. Yeah, I got stopped by the cartel in Mexico. Oh shit. <laughs> I'm, I'm cycling down this road next thing pickup truck er, er, to stop either side of me down this little what? side road all guys jump out machine guns and everything surround me oh, wow yeah. and what happened <laughs> my, my backside was going like that <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it, it all turned out okay like but you know I was, I was, I was a bit nervous felt vulnerable you know because at any moment well, yeah, but what did um, they do? What, they just want to ask money or they were they just seen me filming. Ah. So they wanted to see what I was filming. So I passed them, I had two phones. I passed them an old phone that didn't work because I thought I don't want them to take me good one. And uh -huh. then they, they sort of didn't really do much. Then they left and then I put my GoPro on. I thought they'd long gone. Put my GoPro on, started talking to my GoPro, cycling. Back again. Oh, shit. This can get serious now. <laughs> And, oh. you know, it was, it was, they were all business um, and um, they weren't threatening or anything. They weren't trying to bully me or scare me. You know, they oh. were just checking me out. You know, eventually they bought the um, memory card that my GoPro because I'm scared. I, I couldn't work out how to delete it off my GoPro, <laughs> the video. Oh. So yeah, eventually they bought that off me. They offered me to buy, they offered me cocaine, offered me weed. Um, the, the, <laughs> biggest, the biggest worrying bit was the main guy, he was on the phone to the boss all the time. So it's like if the boss said, oh, kill him, you know, they just, you know, they wow. would, I know that would have happened. They, they've been fighting with the army not so long ago. Yeah. There, around that area. So there was a bit where this truck was coming towards us. This is where I really got scared. Um, the guy goes, he hadn't got his machine gun. He run back to the truck to get his machine gun. And I'm like, I don't want to be in the middle of a crossfire. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm straddling on my push bike. So he's like, oh, oh it's okay. But <laughs> uh, I, felt, I, I felt quite, you know, just really vulnerable after that bike. You know what I mean? Because yeah, you know you like it. Wait, did you bicycle all the way down, down Mexico then? 
Yeah. Um, I went from Houston to Mexico City, then flew to Colombia. Oh, okay. Jesus. Now, uh, but Mexico's crazy, right? Like, I don't want to go to Mexico, actually. It's right next to my country, but I don't want to go. Saying that, loads of people were so nice to me in Mexico. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Even, even, even the cartel were fine with me. They were all right with me. They were laughing. We were laughing and joking. But, you know, it's still in the back of your mind. They can kill me at any moment. But, yeah. You know, I, they, I, I haven't got anything bad to say about Mexico. I, I loved it there, and, and the food's amazing. You know? And, yeah, the, food, and, well, the Mexican food is, is, is bomb. I love Mexico. That's one thing. What's funny is even though I'm here in the States, I've been eating probably way more Mexican food than any other thing. It's so hard to get good Mexican food in fucking in Asia. You know how that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's not easy, is it? I know one restaurant in Paz here, and it's, it's like that, like, you know, so. Yeah, and it's always way overpriced too. So it's like, ah, Mexican food's supposed to be cheap. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly oh. big pots of things that they cook stuff in for, for like a day. And then they make these tacos, it just melts in your mouth. It was like, oh. oh. All right. Yes. Eventually I'll go. <laughs> I feel <laughs> safe. <laughs> yeah, it's not so bad. Honestly, it was, oh. I, went down a, I went down a side road into. It was Tampolinas or whatever it is, which is the big drug growing area now where all the uh -huh. cartels are right near the border. You know, and I could have gone on and I could have been okay. You know what I mean? They just wanted to know. So I, I, I was I, Spanish. I, yeah, I, no, no, I've got no Spanish. So it wasn't pretty. <laughs> no habla, no habla. I don't want to say bad things about Mexico. It was good, man. Uh, a lot of people were kind to me as well, though. So uh, no, that's cool. awesome, man. Yeah. That's cool, then. <laughs> I, so getting back to fighting, I see, have you got a, what's Fight Pro? I see you advertising that a lot. Is that, is that your brand or is that some of your own? I know, like, um, so we were, we were working with Fight Pro because they were a long-term sponsor of mine for like four to five years. They sponsored me and he wanted to open a store in Phuket and, uh, uh -huh. and, so he, he did it. He did it with us because my wife made it made it so much easier to have my wife uh, to to have things in my wife's name and make it easy and uh, can cut a lot of corners if you have a, a, a trustworthy Thai partner. And yeah. Uh, but yeah, but everything kind of went south. Uh, well, I mean, it was we had it for maybe ten months, but then everything kind of went south uh, because of coronavirus, and it was already kind of bad the last low season in Thailand, the last low season was probably one of the worst low seasons ever. And then uh -huh. high season comes. And as soon as high season comes, coronavirus comes. And, uh, and it was, it was just really bad. There just wasn't very much tourists in Phuket and yeah, things weren't going well. And so I did my last, uh, Thailand fighting chamber show February 15th. And we ended up closing the fight Bro store like a week after my show. So February 20 mm -hmm. something. And then my wife went back to her hometown and then I went back to Singapore to go coach. And so we, we were running a store um, for fight bro in Phuket, but yeah, we ended up, it, everything got all closed down now. And yeah. yeah. And I'm now, then now it's like, uh, yeah, now, now I'm not even really representing I still have a bunch of their stuff and a bunch of their gear. So I, you know, I wear them and stuff, but, uh, but I'm open to be sponsored. I'm, I, I'm, I'm looking to get sponsored by another brand eventually. Uh huh. Yeah. Let me. All right. Let, let, let me let me speak to someone. I've got a friend who's meant to be coming on either this week or next week. He does hostile. Uh, I'll I'll speak oh, to nice. him. So yeah, because especially with the uh, BKFC coming up, I'm trying to get something because uh, Fibro is actually a Chinese company, and coronavirus hit them hard, and it hit our store hard, and because they hit the store hard, it, it, yeah, it just made the relationship not that good because. Uh -huh. like there's nothing me like me and my wife could do it's like yo like uh <laughs> there's no customers coming the, the low season was bad high season's worse and like we weren't going to stay in phuket for like a few months but not getting paid trying to keep things afloat and everything when everything was locked down so it was better for her to go back to her hometown and so yeah so i'm not really we're working with piper anymore and, yeah so uh -huh. hopefully yeah hope hopefully i get a new monster and then uh now that I'm back in the States, I've really been trying to look, especially because the BKFC is getting really big now, the bare knuckle stuff, and hopefully he's will be interested. Even just getting their name with Tyson made it made them bigger, didn't it? 
even just putting the oh, bid yeah. out for Tyson. Well, man, Artem Lobov and that Jason Knight, they had some crazy fit, a crazy, crazy <laughs> fight. It was like fight of the year, and it was like – and that blew them up. And, um, and, there, and of course, BKFC loves playing with the rumors that Conor McGregor and all these big-name guys sign. Yeah, Mike Tyson yeah, hasn't yeah. signed with them, but it's apparently they've talked to him, but he, he hasn't confirmed to sign with them or nothing like that. They can't afford him, can they? Nah, no way. They, I don't think there's any way they could pay him $20 million. But – but it's cool, and every, like everybody loves seeing it. And also, there's just not very many shows right now still going on since the coronavirus stuff. Besides UFC, so even the July 24th show will should get a lot of attention just because uh, there's not there's just not that much many shows going on. So hopefully, especially if you can have a live gig. Yeah, so they got a live audience, and they're gonna have the pay, they have their pay per view as well. So um, yeah, should be should be awesome. Should be a good, should be a good time. You know, you I fight him. Yeah, I'm finding a guy named Joe Elmore. He trains and lives in Atlanta. Um, he's uh-huh. like 13 and 12 as a professional MMA fighter. Um, but he has a lot of fights, apparently. Not listed, supposedly. Um, I have a good friend that used to actually, that used to work at the same gym he works at in Atlanta that told me about him a little bit. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the fight. On paper, I think I'm favored, obviously. I have more fights, better record. But, uh, yeah. but he's a big boy. He's, we're fighting at his weight class, 77, at welterweight. So, um, okay. Expect, yeah, so. But it should be fun. Yeah, I'm, I don't want to cut mean, a lot I'm of weight anyway. Uh, knuckle now. I've had two bare-knuckle boxing fights in uh, in London. So, this will be my uh-huh. third bare-knuckle boxing. But I fought three left-weight fights as well already, uh, which, is bare, which is basically bare-knuckle as well, but bare-knuckle Muay Thai with uh, headbutts. <laughs> yeah. if, if you could fight anything, what would you fight? I like Lethway. I actually really do enjoy Lethway. Um, I do like the headbutts. I, I actually would like to fight Valley Tudo eventually, like MMA, like bare knuckle MMA. I think that would be a lot uh-huh. of fun. Um, bare knuckle MMA with headbutts, like soccer kicks, knee ground knees. Like I would like to do all that, um, just to have that credential. Or just because, Is like, anyone doing that now? I, uh, they're talking uh, maybe in Poland. I think Poland's going to do a show like that now next. Uh-huh. I forget the name of it. Uh, had a weird Russian or Eastern European name that they announced they're going to do Valley Tudo. I would actually, if I ever could get the money or sponsor with TFC, I would like to do a Valley Tudo show in TFC. Uh, John Nuts talked about that for Full Metal Dojo as well, but you know, he, he we just need sponsors. It's hard to do this because, uh, I'm like I gotta pay the morning about, about that. I'll ask, I'll ask him whether he's gonna do it for you. <laughs> yeah, but well, I mean, because like, like, but he has to get a sponsor too, because it's not like he can pay me like twenty thousand baht or thirty thousand baht mm-hmm. to fight Valley Tudo. He or, and he, even if I do agree to that money, it's very unlikely that my opponent will agree to that money. So it's yeah, uh-huh. it's, that's why yeah, it's, that's why we need sponsors. But sponsors, cash sponsors are so hard to get in this industry. Really. Really, really is. Even as a fighter, as a promoter, it's a pain in the ass. So, how did you tell me about your uh, Thailand fighting championships? Then I've seen, I've seen a few uh, events. They've always been in Phuket when I was when I was I was never in Phuket at the time when they were on. So, uh, so we, our, our first two events we did them in Kalak. Uh, this that was like a 2017 is when we first started, and then we had a long layoff for like two mm-hmm. uh, little just over two years. We we didn't do a show. We lost a lot of money the first two shows. It was a really bad idea. We did it in Calock. There just wasn't enough tourists and people. Calock is a beautiful place. It's about two hours from Phuket. Nice resorts and stuff like that, but there's mm-hmm. just not enough uh, traffic. There's just not enough people. But um, So, yeah, in 2019, we came back. Uh, in October 2019, we did our first show in Phuket. My wife got all her licensing with the sports authority. We're allowed to do shows in Phuket for the next three years, like legally. That's mm-hmm. the one big difference. Uh, John Nutt doesn't need it with Full Metal Dojo, the other pro MMA show in Thailand. Um, but m- me and my wife, we've gotten sanctioned by the sports authority. We we actually have she has her license through the sports authority, so we're allowed to okay. promote MMA, promote Muay Thai, bo- pro boxing as well. Um, mm-hmm. So that's nice. Uh, we can actually do it at a venue because back in the day, it was a whole, it was really really hard. Had to have police. You had to have pay off all the right people to hold an event and uh yeah so, but so it's nice we got got we're actually like legal through the sports authority that's a huge thing but um yeah october we did our show and and i really just like our first two shows were only mma but i 
one of my next shows to be really focusing on pro boxing, a little bit of Muay Thai and MMA as well, just to make it easier mm -hmm. to fill the fight cards because it's really hard and it's really, really expensive to just have a full MMA show. Fighters okay. are so fickle. MMA fighters are probably the worst to deal with. Um, just They're so fickle about their matchups, who they're fighting, money they're getting paid. Oh, even if, even like, if I get two pro debut guys. I thought it would worse than boxing. Nah, boxing is still so much easier, I feel like, to, to, to find matchups. And so, especially Muay Thai. Guys, you just need to find two guys the same weight, and they'll fight each other. But uh -huh. they don't really care. As long as they have a roughly amount, round, amount, the same amount of fights, or close to it, or sometimes not even at all. But, but MMA fighters, like, fuck, I'll get two pro debuts to fight each other. And they'll be like, oh... But hey, what 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 does Belt Beach J? What country is he from? Uh, does he have wrestling? Oh, how many amateur fights does he have? Those like, it just like it's kind of smart, but also it's just so annoying how fickle they are and just yeah. how unreliable they are. So uh, lately, I've only been having a couple of MMA fights on each show, like two or three, and the rest have been just boxing or Muay Thai. It's been easier that way, to be honest. So. Yeah, I, think, I didn't think it'd be that bad. I thought most of them would be anytime, any place, anywhere. You know what I mean, Martin? Well, like, I like to think that I have that reputation. Like, I'll fight anybody, especially if the money's right. If you're paying me to fight, I'll fight any rule set, anywhere. Like, as long as, like, I'm not paying money to fight, I'll, I'll usually do it. But, uh, but no, all these other fighters here in, in Thailand, especially all those foreigners, the Falang fighters, they talk, oh, we're so hungry, we want to fight. We just want the opportunity, want the chance, want the chance. Uh, trust me, I've given guys chances, and I've had plenty of fighters turn shit down or just say, oh, no, is there any other matchup or any other guy? And, and Yeah, there's a lot of guys who a – lot, a lot of MMA fighters in, based in Thailand that are all talk, really. And uh -huh. it's super, super annoying. But they and, – and, and Grant, there are some other guys that are badasses too. They'll fight anybody, and, and those guys are awesome. Those guys make the show worthwhile. They make – promoting it worthwhile but those guys are honestly the few and far between not everybody's actually like that most guys are real fickle well i was, I was having a look i was googling you the other day like and i seen someone come up what, what's going on with you and one fc ah. what was that all about <laughs> i seen someone i'm reading it. it's like one <laughs> fc threatening with what's going on there oh that was that that was our actually i just over or just a year ago, I think. Yeah, it was literally uh -huh. last year. One year ago, this happened. And uh, so Arnold Lapont shared an article. There's a couple of people shared an old article about 1FC saying they're going to drug test all fighters in 2020 or, or yeah. all, all fighters in 2019. Um, so it's an article that everybody's going to get drug tested. Uh, you know, everything's going to be like that. That 1FC is like legit. Every, like, um, yeah, everybody gets tested for performance enhancing drugs, blah, blah, blah. But I, didn't, I don't even care about performance enhancing drugs. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I actually think it's cool when all fighters are taking steroids, like, like in pride days. I actually think the fights that, are yeah. better. It, yeah, I don't like – I think it's more entertaining. But I'm so sick of one championship always making an announcement and some insane shit that's just completely untrue. So I made a big article. Or I, was like, I shared the article and just said it was complete bullshit. They said they're sanctioned by WADA, or they got a WADA affiliation, which is uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency. Mm -hmm. But so I started educating people on what that actually means. I was like, that doesn't mean like uh, WADA, these officials, there's like some officials that are a third party that are going to come to one, one event and test the fighters. That's not what, what that means. What, that, what, what, uh, what it means with WADA, and I won't named the guy I named him before but I won't just because I don't want to get threatened to get sued again but there's this Taiwanese doctor who's been working for one championship for years since uh -huh. uh, back in the day before one championship there was a show called martial combat which was like which basically was the beginning of what before one championship and he's been working with with one championship since the martial combat days since like 2009 or 2010 and uh, uh -huh. this this doctor and in, in, uh in Taiwan, he owns a clinic in Taiwan, and he's really close to one championship. He's always at the events. He's always one of the doctors. Um, so he's one of their guys, basically. And what they can do is they, his clinic can get certified or get like almost like an affiliation can get like sanctioned by uh, – certified by WADA. 
the therapy. Okay. Uh, his 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 clinic is a WADA lab. That he is uh, yeah. has the his WADA authority or something or, or or yeah, he's certified by WADA basically. And I was like, ah, that's not the same thing as somebody a third party testing these guys. That's not the same thing. Like even when there's weigh-ins and they do hydration tests, it's they don't film them all. They do two days of weigh-ins now. It doesn't get filmed. It's not public. It's all behind mm-hmm. closed doors. The fighters go like you, nobody actually knows what the hell's going on. And if all fighters, I've been there with some fighters for the hydration tests and seen this stuff. And and like I know my guy what did the hydration test, but I don't know if everybody did. And I don't know if the Evolve mm-hmm. fighters because Evolve like. Chatry owns Evolve and owns one, one championship. I don't know if all of those guys are doing that. Like Angela Lee, I don't know if she's in a real, she's not a, it's, she doesn't look like a real Adam Way. I don't know if she's passing her hydration tests. So I don't know. Anyways, I just called him out on all of this and I explained oh, okay. how they got the WADA affiliation. And, um, and Chatry commented on my post. And actually, before Chatry actually commented on my post, it was my first of all. My post was on my private uh, Facebook page. It wasn't on my. It wasn't. Or sorry, it wasn't on my public page. It was on my private account. So it wasn't like, uh, you know, it was just for my personal, my my friends and people to see them on my 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 personal account. But he commented on personal and brought like twenty times more attention, and and then it got picked up by articles, and and then a bunch of other journalists picked it up, and and then it, it just blew up, and then um. And then uh, I got contacted after chat recontact like content or commented on my post. I got contacted by a bunch of people that worked for one FC. A lot of people that I know that messaged me to delete the post. They're basically like threatening me to delete it almost. And uh, and then finally, I I said I wasn't going to delete it. And then boom, I got an email in my my email account that from a one FC lawyer that's saying they're going to sue me for like for uh, what is it? Definitely. What do you what? What, what do you call it? Uh, where defamation you, when you're talk- law. Yeah, defamation. Slander. Yeah, they're going to, yeah. Sl- not slander, uh, libel. Libel. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 They're going to sue me for libel and, and, yeah, defamation, all this bullshit. And, and so no matter what, I actually uh, talked to John Nett about it. I talked to uh, John Nett. Let me talk to one of his lawyers about it. They're saying, yeah, the libel laws are real fickle, even though I'm not based in Thailand because my wife and they know I'm always in Thailand, they could sue me in Thailand. Uh, they could oh, sue that. me in Singapore and they threatened to sue me in America, Thailand and Singapore. And I was like, wow. oh, fine. if they really wanted to though, they're a multi-million dollar company. They really supposedly they're a billion dollar company. They could actually, they could really legitimately sue me if they wanted to. And, and because yeah, the, I'm, the libel laws in Thailand, are crazy. Yeah, the yeah. libel laws are ridiculous. In Thailand. Even because if you're Chattery telling the Thai, truth, yep. Even if you're telling the truth in Thailand, you can still be liable. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like it's just in favor of the rich people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like, uh, and that's the whole thing with the, that's the whole court system in general, though. Like, if they sue me, and if I just don't have enough money to defend myself, hire a lawyer, or 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 even yeah. appear in the court, like, let's say they sue me in America, and I don't make my court appearance. I'm going to automatically lose the case. I'm going to get dismissed. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I don't have the money to defend myself against a giant like that. But um, <laughs> well, what's funny is I do have some screenshots from Chatry from years ago when he was uh, like talking mad shit to me and, uh, and said some crazy shit that he wouldn't want people to see. Like he would mm-hmm. not want people. People think Chatry's this honorable figure and he's such a great promoter and uh, such a nice guy. And he all he cares about is honor, integrity, and all these bullshit trigger words that that don't mean anything um but yeah i know the real chat read. i've had real meetings with him back in what's funny is i i've been i've been we we had a really bad discuss like the one screenshots i have uh, of he sent some crazy shit to me and then shortly after he sent crazy shit to me he offered me the tryout for the evolved team uh offered mm-hmm. me and my friend at the time to try out so i had sit down meetings with him about possibly joining the evolved and one championship and all this shit. And, and I just never did it. I don't trust that guy for anything. And, and, uh, and I, if they ever did actually try to sue me and, 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 and try to hurt me, I would just become a PR nightmare for them. Cause I don't think Chattery wants those screenshots going out to the whole world and people can actually see who he really is. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I don't think they would actually sue me because he, they don't want that. So 
anyways, I just mind my own business now. I, I just remember <laughs> I just saw Arnaud and a bunch of people share the article that they were doing drug tests. And I remember I just, I just explained it to people and yeah, chat recommented on it and it got all blew up. And then, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that, that was funny. I don't think I'm allowed at one FC events anymore. I used to corner a lot of fighters at one championship, but I'm pretty sure I'm not allowed to anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where, where's, your, where's your favorite place to fight? Taiwan. I like China a lot, but put in. Uh, I, lo I love Taiwan. What's well, funny, I hate China. Mainland China is the worst place to fight in the world. It's probably the worst place to visit, the worst place to live, the worst place to uh. <laughs> But But, but what's funny is how much I hate mainland China. I do love Taiwan, though. Taiwan is my favorite country in Asia. And for people uh -huh. that don't know that are listening, Taiwan is the Republic of China. Uh, which is, but they, they're, they're separate, you know, and, uh, but a lot of, but, um, so I'm not racist against Chinese people. I just hate mainland China. And you were there before, but you came to yeah, my fight in Shanghai. Well, later, hopefully uh, later this year. Man, what's, people just, what's, what's so good about Taiwan? I've not been. Oh, Taiwan is, the people are, okay. Taiwan is what China could have been if no communism happened. Uh-huh. I'll let you just like, I'll let you kind of like puzzle, ponder that for a second. But like, like after World War II, if communism didn't destroy their culture and there wasn't the cultural revolution and Mao didn't kill everybody. And uh, Taiwan would like China would have probably looked a lot more like Taiwan. I always say Taiwan is the real China because China, mm -hmm. it actually, it's more like real Chinese culture. Ch mainland China is, you know, communism really did kill their culture, killed their value system. Like, you know, like China, China's nickname is the country with no soul. And that's a, I really do believe that, you know? So. Yeah, I, I was pretty sad when I went to China and it's just no nice buildings. No, it's, it's, they've it's, all gone pretty much, haven't they? You know what I mean? It's, it's quite sad. You know and even I mean? like their historical sites, they just, they, they, they refurbish them or whatever. And they, and they actually, in a way they destroy them. They like. I went to this place in Guangzhou, this like big temple. And then I like filled the monuments and stuff. And it's just like plastic. It's not, they even, mm -hmm. it's, it's not, it's not real. None of it's real anymore. And, and they, and all, even all their cities look the same. We call, I call them cookie cutter cities. Cause they just, they have the same layouts, the same style buildings everywhere. And it just, it's really weird. I mean, it's, it, there's some things really cool about China, like how they develop so fast, how there's bullet trains everywhere. Everybody pays a WeChat. WeChat is kind of convenient. Not, not, it is convenient, but it's fucking uh, outside the government control, like under, outside those crazy connotations and the conspiracy theories. Like, there's a lot of things very convenient about China, but yeah, I just didn't like it. Taiwan has great food, great people, super, super nice people. Like, <laughs> like, uh, I don't know. You just experience the culture a little bit different. People are actually, you know, you know, in China, nobody lines up. Everybody cuts you off, spits everywhere. The amount of times I've seen people urinate in public, the amount of times <laughs> I've seen human shit on a sidewalk in China in random <laughs> cities. Uh, I, was, it, yeah. I was just about to say, when, we, when I was in Shanghai, we mates were sitting in their apartment looking out, and I, I was in the same block, and he looked across at the shopping center, and the people from the restaurants were coming, going onto the roof of the building, taking a dump, and then going back down to the restaurant and like having a cigarette upstairs. And it's just like, oh, man. Oh, it's so oh. disgusting. What's, what's crazy is one, I was in the subway in, 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 uh, in, in Shanghai and or the MRT. And uh, this lady was holding her kid. And the, this kid is not even like a super small. This kid is like six years old. Kind of holding him up a little bit so he can pee in one of the trash cans in the subway. And holding him no. up so he was peeing in the trash can. And the, tra and the trash cans have like the plastic like liners and stuff. But what was, what was absurd is if they would have walked 20 meters down, there was a public, like there was a public restroom that they could have used. But no, I'm just going to pick up, I need to go pee right now. So I'm just going to go right now, wherever I'm at. They just stop what they're doing. Yeah. And the amount of time, and like when I, t when I talk and I tell people about this, they think that I just must have saw it one or two times. Every single time I go to China, I, I probably see somebody, I will, we'll see somebody urinate in public or spit in, 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 uh, indoors. How many times have been stuck in the elevator with a bunch of mainlander Chinese people? They spit on the elevator floor. I'm in a nice hotel and people are spitting on the floor. 
we're eating in like the, this banquet hall and people are eating and spitting on their like it's so just dis- ah it drives me nuts <laughs> I've, I've, I've not seen that actually just spitting inside so much the one that gets me is is when so you're in the elevator the doors open etiquette is you let the people out and then you yeah. go in no no they're trying to get in a full elevator and it's like what, what are you doing yeah, at way first I'd be, I'd be like that. Now I just walk but out and I'll just no, back like, into anyone. And they and like when when I when I've talked to some Chinese people one on one and I explain these things, they get offended. Like I'm talking bad about them. Like I'm like, no, this is just crazy. I'm not talking. It's like, yo, people need to like. There, there's no etiquette. There's no common courtesies. There's like, and they know they're wrong. Like, even same thing on subways. Subway door opens. Usually courtesy. People get off. Then people come in. As soon as that door yeah. opens, people are going to try to charge in and get get a spot and not let people get off first. And it drives me insane. It's, yeah, Shanghai's the worst place I've been for that. Uh, but, yeah, you go to Taiwan. It's not like that. They're uh-huh. <laughs> not yeah, like I've that seen, at I've all. I've seen you train at Taiwan quite a bit. No, I love yeah, – so I was – back in the day, me and my – one of my best friends, his name's Florian Gorel. He used to fight for one championship as well. Um we were the founders of the Taiwan top team. He still lives oh. there in Taichung. He's married to a Taiwanese woman, and he still runs the gym. Um, but yeah, yeah, so it's kind of cool that we were the yeah we were the founders of the Taiwan top team. And uh, yeah, I go there often. I try to go there at least once or twice every year. Uh, sometimes I'll just go, hey, Florian, can I come and stay with you and hang out? And you want to train me and help me get ready for a fight and corner mm-hmm. me? And you know, I'll give him some of my purse. I'll give him like 20, 30% of my purse. And I'll just go and stay with him for like a month and then. And uh, my first bare knuckle boxing fight, that's what I did. I flew there, boom, again, and I just stayed with them and with them, and I got ready for my fight. And it was pretty awesome, yeah. <laughs> I love Taiwan. If I, if I could settle down anywhere in Asia, after, like, when I retire from fighting, I would want to settle down in Taiwan. I don't think okay. I would actually want to settle down in Thailand. But, no. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I want to split the time on, on that 50-50 with Thailand and, and think. So – What's what happens like with most fights? Like we know what the UFC does on on testing for PEDs. What do most companies do? Is it just nothing? Oh. Or? No, most companies don't test at all. Um, in America, you have the athletic commissions, which is the government. What the government does uh-huh. te- test. They, they um, usually on the smaller regional shows, they'll they'll usually test the main event, and they might randomly select to test one or two guys on the card. Um, but they usually always test the main event or if somebody's fighting for a title they will test them on a regional show and the ufc everybody gets tested um when i fought mm-hmm. in the ufc against holloway we got tested i got tested tested twice um i got tested i think before before the day before the show and i got t- tested right after the fight as well mm-hmm. um which was interesting yeah um so i, I mean that, that was cool but i mean because i knew that was like what to be expected in the ufc but none of these shows even pancreas in japan uh, all the shows in China, none of those shows, they, none of them test. But that's what drove me nuts about 1FC is like, I don't care that they don't test, but don't say you're going to test and that you're sanctioned by these guys or this and that. Don't tell me you're going to do something and not do it. Just like they say they're going to have 50 shows in 2020, but they barely done like two. Granted, coronavirus, but still, they won't even do 20. Like now the shit's over. Like they always make some absurd announcement. They never keep their word. Yeah, what's it? What's it like fighting in Japan? You fought Pancras. The money is actually not that great in Japan, but I love. I do love Japan. I love Japanese. Like I like the culture. I like the audience. Uh-huh. Like I always have. I always have a great time in Japan. But um, but same thing anywhere. No matter where I fight in Asia, whether it's Japan or China, I'm always the enemy. If I'm fighting a Japanese guy, I'm or I'm fighting Korea or fighting China, I'm gonna be the enemy. I'm the judges are. I gotta go the extra mile to win the judge's decision so just because it's japan people think samurai is an honor nah it's just like anywhere else in the world if you're the white guy or the foreigner or or whatever and you're fighting the local guy that you better you better fight your ass off and try to finish the guy because it's going to be hard to win the decision but um but i love japan like uh, my uncle lives in in fukuoka in south of japan um i always Uh yeah the japanese food is amazing so the culture like there's so much shit to do and see uh Japan is like Japan's wild because there's no other place like it in the world. 
I, like in a way that's kind of like why like uh, I like Thailand so much. Thailand and Japan are so they really are so unique and uh, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, what's it called? Um, I'm, I was speaking to a friend who's in who's in um, Tokyo at the moment. He's a he's a guy from Chicago. He fought in Pancrase once, I think, or twice, and oh, nice. um, he, he 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 loves it over there. You know, oh, it's, so much it's, fun. it's one of his favorite countries. He's, he he. He was a coach of mine when um, in in Pattaya. So, oh, cool! Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, Japan's. It's just so cool because everywhere you go, there's just something to do, something to see, like neon lights. Tokyo is a crazy city. It just it's just so fast and busy, and there's so much stuff going on. And I don't know. It's really cool. Like I can literally just go walk the streets of Tokyo for hours and just and have a great time. Like me and my wife, anytime mm-hmm. we've gone to Tokyo, we'll just go walk the streets and look at different shops and just, just there's so much interesting shit that we've never seen before. Or like, you know, I'll, I'll always be like surprised by like a little alleyway and there's like some little shop and I don't know, it's just so nice. And yeah, it's it. somewhere I want to get to probably next year. I think I'll, I'll take a, I'll go for a weekend there when when I'm back in China. Yeah, mm-hmm. do like do a, do a four day weekend or something or a pre four day weekend and have, yeah, oh, well, because. I- my job, I only normally work three days a week, so um, oh, nice. I can have it on weekends, which is cool. Yeah, because like if you go to Tokyo, like Tokyo is actually like not my favorite city. I love Osaka. I think Osaka is like probably my favorite city. But uh, uh-huh. in Tokyo, you can just go to like one district of Tokyo, Akihabara or Shinjuku or Shibuya. And if you can probably spend your whole weekend in that one little district and have an amazing time yeah. and see new shit all, every day. But like Tokyo really does take some time to explore and, and, and see everything properly. You're gonna have, you probably have to make mm-hmm. a couple of trips to Tokyo. But now I've been to Tokyo a few, like so many times. I, um, I want to see more of the countryside. I want to go to like Osaka more, or go to where my uncle lives in Fukuoka in the south. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm okay. Like now that I, I feel like I've seen Tokyo enough because I've been there. I think like five five or six times now. So, yeah. but yeah, definitely go next time you get a vacation while you're in China. Go. Yeah, it's 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 on it's on my list of places to go. I, I want to go and have a visit there and go and see, go and eat sushi in Japan. I love sushi, you know what I mean. So yeah. it's just you, you got to say you got to when you're there, haven't you? So, are you still on Zhengzhou? In uh, when when you go to I, back I to China, we... just organised it to go back to Zhengzhou. Yeah, so nice. Um, Do you like Zhengzhou? No, it, <laughs> it's it's a, yeah, it's a. Cookie cut city, it's a cookie, yeah. cookie cutter city. Um, it, it's, it's okay, but the job suits me, you know. Ah, good, good. You know so what I mean? So they let me, I'm, I'm a bit different. So they let me buy what I want to do. So it, it really suits me. It's three days a week. So yeah, it just fits. And that means I can go for a long weekend in Thailand. I can do I find it quite friendly there as well. So, yeah, that, that's the thing. Like mainlander yep. Chinese, like uh-huh. yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, like okay. mainlanders are are. You hear me? Mainlanders are friendly. Like, but yeah, yeah. my biggest problem with mainlanders is like when they're in large groups or like you're taking the public transport or just like like it's really hard. But like whenever I've, I've met mainlanders like one on one or like. Or even at the gyms I've been at to coach at, people they've always been super friendly and helpful. And if I ask for help and, and somebody speaks English and stuff, like they've always been able to to, to help me out while I'm there. So I, I do shit on China a lot, but like it's it's not always bad. And it is a great place to make money. It is there's a lot of money to be made to be made there. And even as a fighter, I always tell fighters it's one of the places you'll probably make more money fighting. Uh, even if you're not like a, have a big record, you'll always make a decent fight person made in China. Mm-hmm. Especially if you go fight in China, then go back to Thailand. It's pretty good, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, like I, I find it friendly that there was one time I was cycling at a flat tire, and it's like seven in the morning. So I went into this housing estate, and it just looks like it's bombed out. So I sort of pointing at my tire, and then the guy goes, "Come on." He, he knocks his fella up, wakes his fella up, he comes to the door, ah, dressed, laughs at me, goes back in, gets changed, comes and fix my tyre. You know what I mean? It was just like, yeah, didn't care. Yeah. Just woke up. 
all for nothing, you know what I mean? Whereas <laughs> Places that you don't get that, so it's like I miss that. But yeah, I, I get used to it more now. Yeah. So what What do you think? What, what's happening in the world now? Of everything, COVID and all that stuff. Uh, if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine because I know it's an emotive subject. But no, nah, like COVID, I like I really yes, COVID. I feel like COVID. People should can take it seriously, and like. Use common sense, but it's it's still so crazy to me, like how the whole world reacted to the virus the same exact way. It re- makes me really do believe in like a new world order, just seeing how the stuff that's going on. Even in America, like more rights are getting taken away from people and, and how they can just lock everybody up in the houses. And Yeah, I, I don't like what's going on in the world. And I, like, I, yeah, I don't like it at all. And I don't think that I don't think COVID is as serious as they're making it seem, and as as deadly as they make it seem. But I do I understand we need to take it seriously. But I'm going to protect myself how I protect myself against the flu, and just try to stay healthy and eat healthy and like live healthier lifestyle. But instead, it's like they're not educating people on that. They're just uh, they're they're just like trying to control them and put put you know we can't put people in boxes. I don't don't like it. I think that like the way we fix this is everybody needs to just live healthier lifestyles and not, not eat like shitty food all the time. Not, but like it's crazy in America too because like fuck every over half of America. As soon as I fuck landed in America at the airport, I knew I was in America because I looked around yeah. and over half the people were overweight or obese. You know. <laughs> so when when I was in Houston, what I noticed was the most things you'll see are fast food. And pharmacies, yeah. It's like just so many, so many, almost as many pharmacies as fast food. And it's like, hang on a minute, why? Why do you need so many pharmacies? Yeah, and they're all twenty-four hour. And it's like, what? What's going on? And there was, I said, there was an old woman in front of me at one, and she's like, she's got a prescription off a doctor for probiotics. And it's like, but really, the doctor should be saying, eat yogurt, eat kimchi, eat, you know, just change your diet. But she's buying probiotics you know what i mean it's like come on yeah well at least in america the pharmaceutical industry is so powerful every no matter what there's a pill for everything everybody apparently has some sort of anxiety issue focus issues or they got depression or they got like there's some ridiculous commercials i was i was on uh in idaho when i was sitting on the couch in idaho i was seeing that do you have uh bipolar disorder or, or it was like dual bipolar disorder but it, it was it like reminding me of like a, a parody or like like i was like are they taking the piss are they just joking here are they are like but no it's a serious commercial and it's like it's like oh you have bipolar disorder if you have this 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 and, and everybody thinks that there's something wrong with them in america and everybody's everybody's on some type of pharmaceutical and i'm just so anti that i don't want to take pills for anything i, I, I'm, I want to be like my natural self and i like mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not gonna make myself sick. I'm gonna eat, you know. But instead of just you know eating healthier and living a healthier lifestyle, people would rather just take a pill for everything. That's much easier than exercising. It's much easier than dieting, and it's it's yeah, yeah it's kind of sad, you know. And uh, well, as far as what's going on in America with the riots and the protests and all this shit too, it's a right now America's in the election season, and every single election is race gets brought up and. You know, one side makes the other side try to look like they're racist, or like Democrats always try to make Republicans look like they're racist to try to, or, or hateful, and it's it's such a politics in America have gotten so so nasty, and it's everywhere now. Everybody has an opinion because of social media. Everybody has a voice, and it's so tiring. I'm just all I want to do is train, be positive, and live in my own little bubble, and I try to ignore a lot of that stuff. But it's but it's hard hard to ignore it because i see it everywhere that's what that's one thing i noticed about this cycling trip is you know most people just want to get on with their lives they don't want all that bullshit you know what i mean and most people just do and, and that's what it's even when i was in houston which you said not, not racist like texas and things 
the, the bus is a multicultural, people were coming on, everyone was coming on, everyone was, what I noticed about Houston was one thing they noticed, everyone thanked the driver when they got off, off the bus, and this was in the city centre, and everyone said hello when they got on, which is like, wow, that's really cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there was, there was a nice vibe like that, and I didn't, and then you see, I see all that, that stuff coming, it's like, hang on a minute, that didn't feel the same then, I don't know whether yeah. I'm missing something or I went to the wrong places, but, you know, I, I got, I got most people just you know, just want to get on with their lives, don't they? And want to be. You know. I think everybody's just fired up online because they're like people follow certain pages and they get in this weird little echo chamber, and then like they'll be sitting home at night and they just get fired up online, and then they just they seem like they're so angry and mad, but really you see them a day to day and everybody day to day, and yeah, like that's one thing that's totally different about America than like Asia, is like when I see somebody at, like a stranger at a store you'll say good morning or good afternoon or, Hey, how are you? And mm -hmm. like, or you open the door for a stranger, but that shit doesn't happen in Asia or it doesn't happen. It hasn't happened overseas when I see that. And uh, yeah, people are usually generally friendly. They're, they're sometimes abrasive or for me, like it, because I've been in Asia my entire adult life, when people are like, ask me how I am or, or in my bubble, I'm like, yo, he's all up in my space. What the fuck? This guy's like, <laughs> but no, that's just the way people are. It kind of, I have to reprogram my mind. I'm like, oh no, I'm back in America. Like, this is just the way people mm -hmm. are. <laughs> I, I, I found, I found Texas really friendly, tell you the truth. I, I've not been to Texas before. And like, I was cycling along, so on, it was starting to rain, someone stopped me, then, then they ended up putting me up for the night. You know what I mean? And yeah. another guy, he see me in, a, in like a pound shop, a dollar shop. And I was looking for a, um, a USB charger to plug in the wall. And like the next day, he drives, he sees me, drives up to me, jumps out the car and goes, yeah, I bought two the other day when I went to the shop. I was open to see you. I was like, wow, thanks very much. Wow. You know what I mean? <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Yeah, but, yeah that's so you know, good to hear. <laughs> yeah, it's just super cool. You know what I mean? So, and like the other thing I noticed, which is very different to Asia, which I was, I was really surprised about. A lot of times when I was in restaurants, I'd be the only one on my phone families would be sat there and they wouldn't be on the phone i don't know if that's other places as well like but in asia everyone's like that aren't they you know no one looks yeah. at anybody else oh man i like it's crazy I've, I've been on dates in singapore before and like uh for, this is like way back before but the the girl would check her phone all the time and i'm just like like in america yeah one thing in america when you're hanging out with people or a group of friends like people don't just constantly check their phone and if you do mm -hmm. translate check your phone, they'll, they'll give you shit about it. They'll be like, yeah. hey, They're like, yeah, what you doing? Huh? Oh, you know, like they'll, they'll tease you a little bit if you're always on your phone and stuff. Yeah, if you're with people, you're with people. You know, you're not supposed to be like, yeah, it's, it's, it's rude, but it's so, so normal in, in overseas yeah, it's now. Just, in the subway in Zhengzhou, they've got signs saying, look where you're going, don't look at your phone, which I think is a bit right. pointless. No one will see it, will they? <laughs> yeah yeah they're, they're robots there <laughs> yeah it's just, just so bad you know what i mean people yeah. are just so locked into it and that's what that's one thing i like i was like really surprised by that it was really cool and south america is not so bad either you know um there's not so many people on the phone yeah it's really nice now that's cool that's cool you're traveling everywhere though i mean it sucks that you're stuck right now but hopefully then soon you get back to thailand and go back to we go back to our normal life. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't wait to get get out of here now because I've just been like stuck in an Airbnb for three months on my own, which Fuck. is which, which is a good. <laughs> so I, I, I escape on a Friday night, go back to pharmaceuticals and things. When you're saying about everyone's on a drug, and like I, on a Friday night, I go and go to like an have an ayahuasca ceremony, and people are like, "Oh, be careful, be careful." That's awesome. I'm like, why? If I told you I was taking an antidepressant every day, you wouldn't say anything, would you? And they're like, uh, no. <laughs> well, what's yeah. the difference? Like plant medicine, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, at least it's a plant. And also, yeah, I love Joe Rogan because I, I think about DM, DMT and ayahuasca, and I want to try all those. And I was like, yeah, I want to experience it. Yeah, you, you, you know, one of your next episodes, you got to really talk about, or at least, or at least at the end of your trip there, you got to talk about all your ayahuasca trips and uh -huh. see how, like, what you learned and what you've experienced. And yeah, I'll definitely yeah. be like, curious to hear it. At the moment, it's every Friday. So every Friday, yeah. I'll do an ayahuasca trip. Yeah. So 
That's is awesome. It, so, and, uh, yeah, may, do do a video sorry? journal or something, or at least like, or at least at at the end of all of this, when you be right before you leave Peru, like summarize your experience and tell me like tell yeah, tell us okay, how it yeah, is. No problem at all. I, you know, I, I love talking about myself, so uh, that should be no problem whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's, my good. <laughs> that's why I find this so difficult because I've got to listen more than talk. You know what I mean? It's like. <laughs> <laughs> Was the first trip crazy? Is isn't with ayahuasca you throw up a lot when you take it, right? Um, yeah, you can do. Um, I threw up once the first time. Sometimes I don't throw up now, so sometimes oh, nice. I do. Wow. So. Um, yeah, first time's in Medellin, and I t- took it several times now. You know, how long is the trip? I, I, how how long is it for? Um, probably from about eleven till four, so maybe twelve, about five hours, something like that. Wow! But you drink, you drink a couple of times in between, you know, and uh, yeah. and then I've done another two other different things. Another one is. Um, it's like a cactus plant, uh, San Pedro, ah, yeah. which is like this ayahuasca is the female and, and San Pedro is the male, and that's a totally different experience as well. Oh, wow. And then, not the Friday, just gone the Friday before, we'd done a thing on the Saturday morning. We woke up and we'd done this thing called Yopo, which is from uh, Venezuela. Oh, man. <laughs> it, and it, it's like, you have to sniff loads of it, and it's horrible. And then oh, shit. within seconds, you're like, boom, right in the middle of something. And you're like, oh, man, I, I don't know whether this is a bit much. <laughs> Have you, did you mean, oh, no, I always ask this to like people who I met who have who've done DMT. I was like, did you feel like you met the gods or you met the, that force or like, I don't know. <laughs> no, it's, it's never been that, it's never been that far. And I, I drink a lot when, when I do it, so. I've just been researching loads of that stuff about um, yeah. resurrection stuff, it's called. So, I don't know. But that, that's a near-death experience when they have those things. Ah, uh, so, but supposedly that's what DMT does, though, right? Like, it's almost like a... Some people can do, yeah, yeah, if you take enough of it. But I, I never uh, seem to be able to take that much. But what, is, is ayahuasca, that's the same as the... Isn't there two... Uh, what's the one in America that the... Yeah, the cactus plant. The, the, not the, not the one you just said... In what, Mexico, what? it's peyote. Yeah, that one. Peyote, yeah. peyote, yeah. Yeah, that's peyote. San Pedro, is that peyote. Oh, okay, okay. I just had yeah, a different name for it, okay. Yeah, that's crazy. And ayahuasca, that's the same stuff as like the Brazilian, they, they, they get in Brazil, right, that you're doing? Yeah, all of the Amazon, all of this area. So It's all, all, all the same. Area, ayahuasca, um, marijuana, coca leaves, all of these things are sacred plants. So Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, Venezuela, they're all legal because they're sacred plants. They're, they're you know, they're part of wow. the, the culture and the history. So, so the government hasn't done yeah. anything against it. So it's, uh, wow. you know, you can just do it anyway. You know what I mean? So it's, it's quite good. All right. And it, you know, as long as, you, as long as I'm doing it on a spiritual journey, not, not just doing it like going to a club or something, I, I yeah, a lot, you know what I mean. It helps me sort of sort my head out. And it gives me what I need as well at the moment. I need that connection with people and and also to chill out and laugh a bit. So it's been quite funny lately. You know what I mean? Instead of just serious and <laughs> thinking about. So, yeah, it's good. Do you feel like it's changed your life? Would you say that? Would you would you go that far? Um, yeah, it's, it's obviously changed. It's changed how I think. Yeah. Uh, how profound of a change is I don't know. Um, I suppose it'll all sink in over the next few months, really, because I've been doing it every week. You don't get a chance to absorb it in the same way. So when when I leave here and I, I don't do it again for a while and absorb all the learnings, then I think it'll change me a bit more as well. But, you know, everything wow. changes, doesn't it? Yeah, it I'm excited. Change. Yeah, I'm going to have to hit you up before – before uh, I'll be the one asking you the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm so yeah, interested I'm in that stuff. I just something. never, I've never done it. I'm so interested. though. that sounds ah, it's so cool. <laughs> yeah. When I get my place, when I get my place in Colombia, you'll have to come and stay, and we'll we'll, we'll go for the weekend to do it. Ah, uh, no, that's gonna happen. <laughs> That'll be my first. <laughs> I've been to Brazil, but I only for the UFC. I was supposed to fight in the UFC a second time, but that was right before uh-huh. I got I, I got cut. 
the day of my fight, they, they ended up cutting me when all that crazy shit. Oh, you you're not you're not familiar with this whole story when I got cut from the UFC. No, no, can you tell us? Because I, oh, I didn't wow. see it when I was doing my little research. So like when when I fought Max, okay, so all right, this this is this is, when I got kicked out of the the, the Air Force and the military. Uh-huh. That was in 2009 when that happened. The end of 2009 is when when uh. Yeah, I fucked up. Me and my wife, my ex, my ex wife, got in, like a, had domestics and uh, and then yeah, I, I ended up uh, getting a bad conduct discharge for for uh, it's it's literally called simple assault, which is a misdemeanor. A bad conduct discharge is a misdemeanor. A dishonorable discharge is like a felony, like you killed somebody okay. or you something. So I got kicked out for a bad conduct discharge though, so. and um, so that was in 2009 when that happened. In 2010 is when I went to Thailand and went to Asia. And um, I got signed to the UFC in 2013. I fought Max Holloway January 2014. And I was going to fight in Brazil in April against Diego Brandao. I weighed in. Okay. We had our stare down. And the morning of the fight, because the time difference with Brazil and the state, some journalist on um, the Bleacher Report, I guess, found out on the Reddit or somebody found out that uh, I, I got – I got a bad kind of discharge from the military uh-huh. and uh, they found uh, the actual court file on the pub because it was public record on the air force website and mm-hmm. it, it got blasted and he made, he made this crazy article and it ba- basically it called me a woman beater and they made it uh-huh. the way the article was written though. They made it seem like it happened. Like the art, let's say the article comes out tonight. They made it seem like yeah. it happened last week. So it's uh-huh. 2004, April, 2014 that, the crime in question, me getting kicked out of the military after 10 in 2009. I, I paid my dues. I fought, you know, I completely changed as a human being. I was remarried. Mm-hmm. I got married to my, my Thai wife. We have kids already. And my life's completely different anyways. So the UFC, but the UFC, the article goes, goes viral, goes crazy. Everybody, it was like the biggest MMA story for like one week. I remember I literally woke up to like thousands of tweets directed oh. at me just... I, I knew about that, bit, but I didn't realize that that's what got you kicked out of the UFC. No, yeah, so, so that's what that, that yeah that's what got that. So the when that when that happened, uh, you know, the UFC just didn't want the bad publicity. What they said is they have a zero tolerance towards domestic violence and all that stuff. And uh, and yeah, like I said, I fucked up, and it was definitely not a good time in my life. And it, and uh, and I've definitely I think grown as a person. I'm not that person anymore. Uh, me and my ex wife are fine. I talked to her. Quite often, anytime I want to talk to my daughter, um, I'm supposed to see see them soon because uh, I'm here in Florida now. So, but and also even when I got kicked out of the UFC, me and my ex-wife made a video together. We took our daughter to uh-huh. Disney World and all that bullshit. bullshit. But uh, but yeah. But anyways, that happened when I but I went to Brazil for the UFC and then uh, th- so the only time I went to Brazil was for was for the UFC and then yeah. But anyways, I got cut. So it was the kind of a bittersweet trip. <laughs> Okay, now, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah now, nowadays that wouldn't make any difference, would it? In the UFC now, I, I I think they would take me back as long as I can get a big win streak going on or something else. Like if I can win like four or five fights in a row, I don't think it's such a big deal anymore. Especially considering John Jones and all the crazy shit John Jones has done. And... That's what I mean. If you were in the UFC now and then they found out in the same this, if it happened today, the same thing. Like they wouldn't they wouldn't cut you. Yeah, what I think now, what the biggest deal was, is I'm pretty sure the U.S. Air Force and, like, the Army and stuff, they sponsor the UFC. And I, yeah. I think it was actually their decision that they didn't want. Because oh. it wasn't me. Like, I, like they made it seem like I, uh, like it was like somebody that I served with made it seem like I was bragging that I was in the Air Force, but it wasn't. They asked me how did I get in, the, get in the MMA. And I was like, well, I was stationed in Guam when I was in the Air Force. And I watched my first live MMA event. And I thought I could do it. And I talked about my mm-hmm. dad and different stuff as well. I talked, you know, about Ken Shamrock and all that. But um, but I remember that the one of the ladies when I was doing the weigh-ins, she was uh, she was saying, "Oh, he's a U.S. Air Force veteran," and blah blah blah. And they were they were advertising me as a veteran. But I never ad- asked them to do that. Like, uh-huh. then, you know, people got offended, and yeah. And so the, that story came out, and yeah, that was that was that. So that was the end of my UFC career. <laughs> yeah, well, that, you know what I mean. I, I'm sure you'd rather go out on like having three losses than go out like that. You know? Oh, for sure. If you know I mean, I mean. And, and, and like 
in some regard, because I did fight Holloway, it has it did help me out my career a little bit because it, it's been a it's always been easy to get fight. As soon as people find out I fought Max Holloway, it's always a big deal. Um, it's mm-hmm. really easy to get on other fight cards and stuff. The experience was great. I still made good money against Max Holloway. They paid me for the my show money for the Diego Brandao fight, anyways. Mm-hmm. So I got a free trip to Brazil. Still got my show money, so that wasn't terrible. <laughs> was he was he the hardest fight, Max Holloway? Nah, I've had my, way my, much harder fights in Muay Thai yeah. than Holloway. I've, I've taken, I've gotten, I've taken some beatings, and although Max Holloway beat me and he killed me, he didn't. Like I've taken worse beatings. I should, I don't know if I should brag about that, but yeah, I've had some, especially fighting in Phuket. There's no weight classes. You just show up. You don't know who you're fighting. I remember I fought a guy uh-huh. taller than me. He probably outweighed me by like 40 pounds, 20 kilos. And he broke my arm. He threw a, he- a head kick. I leaned back, but my arm was still still there. And he ended uh-huh. up kicking my arm, and I broke my arm. That was a sh- I think that was a way shittier experience than Max Holloway. <laughs> yeah, that, that fight, I, I, I come to watch you in, in in Shanghai. That was a rough fight as well, man. Oh, that was fun. You, never, you never stopped going yeah. forward. In that. Like, that, was, that, was a, yeah. that was a dog fight, that. <laughs> yeah. That was just a not one nine-minute round. Uh, so, yeah, when me and Russ, Met guys or people anybody listening. Uh, I was in Shanghai. He knew about Full Metal Dojo. We got in touch, and I was fighting on some small event called MAS, uh, Martial uh, Martialism Square or something. And it was like a new rule system. It was like a freestyle stand up fighting, one nine minute round. You either win by knockout or it's a draw. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so I me mean, the this Chinese guy we just fought and just went crazy, and it was just one nine minute round. I couldn't knock him out, finish him. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was a draw. Was... Fight, you had him in the gear team, and yeah, um, he tapped, and, 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 and then they blew the whistle. Yeah, yeah. it was such bull- and, and and they were meant to let that go. It's like, hang on a minute, <laughs> you've got yeah. no chance here, have you? Really, you've got to kill yeah. him. <laughs> yeah, he, that guy kicked the shit out of my leg, <laughs> though. <laughs> I do remember that. Yeah. I remember my leg was sore as fuck. After the fight, I just wanted to go back to my hotel room. I was like, "All right, I'm done. Yo, I just want to get paid and leave." <laughs> I was so, I'm not surprised, so like I, you know, <laughs> any other thought after that. Like, that was a, yeah. that was a tough fight. Fair play. Was you know, what's like, funny is when I when I was a lot younger, no matter what, no matter how beat up I got, no matter what, I was like always out to go party and drink. And after a fight, win, lose, draw, I didn't care. I was always down to go <laughs> celebrate. Nowadays, though, like I realize I'm a much more mature person now because. Even at that, that time when I'm like, yeah, but from basically when I was 25 onward, right after a fight now, I always wait a day. I, I go rest and I'll wait a day. And if I do want to celebrate or drink or party, I'll wait the next day to do it. I'm like, <laughs> and for all those fighters out there, if there's anybody listening, it's so much better for your brain to not drink right after you take headshots. Like you should, should always wait a day and celebrate. And if it really is worth celebrating, you'll celebrate hard the next day instead of a, uh, uh-huh. They, instead of right after a fight, right after your fight is not a good idea to drink. <laughs> Even not after a fight, but just after a night of no sleep on a Saturday after I've done that ayahuasca, I'm like that. Oh, my. <laughs> 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 well, can, are, uh, is there a like a hangover feeling, or can you sleep pretty easy after after you come down off of it, or is the come um, down feeling kind of weird? See, I might get an hour's sleep or something, you know what I mean? And then wait, then, then we finish the ceremony and then I go home. So I come back and it's like, I don't want to sleep that much. Sometimes I'll go to bed and then just most of the time I'll just stay awake and then sleep that night. So I'm not good without sleep. I've done, I've done some like, I've, well, I've done LSD, but I've done like the drops where they do the drops under your uh-huh. tongue. And, uh, and one thing I liked about LSD is it was a flow. Well, I don't I won't say I liked it. I had a super negative, scary trip. But uh, but after it was over, it was over. Like, it was a long – it was like 10, 12 hours. But once it was over, it was fine. I could sleep right away. But I've, like, yeah. partied hard in, like, Bangkok and, of course, taking ecstasy or taking Molly or whatever. <laughs> and the come down off of that stuff, oh, you're going to – it's like 24 hours of, like, terrible sleep and the worst hangover feeling ever. And – uh before I can finally sleep and have like actually recover. <laughs> well, I never used to have a problem with ecstasy. I used to do a lot back in back in the day, like twenty about what, twenty-one years ago I had a really bad drug problem. So that was like heroin and everything in those days. And then oh, before shit. that, you know, um, loads of ecstasies and amphetamines and everything. <laughs> that was why it was a big like thing for me. Body. 
Yeah. <laughs> 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 Saying that, I remember, <laughs> I remember one time, I was like, right, got to clean my life up. So I was living in Manchester, so I went back to my mum's house, which is in North Wales, and I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll clean up, you know what I mean? I'll get off the heroin. So I'm, I'm lying on a sofa because I couldn't go upstairs to bed. So I'm lying on a sofa, like, sort of detoxing. And, and I could see that, you know, do you remember the baby going around the roof on, in, in train spotting? I could see that going oh. around and I was like, oh, I can see myself going around the roof. <laughs> Uh, that's I, I I've, I've never done heroin, but I can't imagine the come down and like like yeah, that detox. I I've seen like documentaries on that shit, and that just seems miserable. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not nice. Yeah. <laughs> try oh, not man. to. That's that's the thing with it. You know, just try to keep <laughs> no, going. No. Ah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was like because my 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 dad was like super into and like amphetamines and different things like that, and he would say. Nah, we just keep partying. He's like, you don't want to come down. You just, you just take more and you just keep going. And so he's like, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And he would always say that it's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> I was just like, nah. You know, I was, I was just trying to have Sundays off when I was taking yeah. off amphetamines and things. You know what I mean? Uh, like as if it made the difference. Yeah. But, uh, no, well, that now from my first Bangkok like like ecstasy trip. That I ever did. But now I already always knew, like, if I'm ever going to do it again and party, I made sure I always left a 24 hours for the next day. I always made sure I planned. I had, like, a, a really relaxing, like, a recovery day. And uh -huh. <laughs> I, I think I'm a very responsible drug user because when I have, like, me and my friends, if I'm, like, with the guys and we're all, you know, partying in a bank park and we're taking eat, we'll, like, we'll, we'll, like, when we leave and go to a different bar or club, we say, hey, we got to stop the 7-Eleven guys. We got to hydrate. We all get water, we hydrate. Hey, you, we got to get the chewy candies. We got to get some gum. We don't want to be grinding our teeth. You know, we're going to, we're going to get gum. We're going to get snacks. We're going to, we're going to hydrate and we're going to be smart. And so I'm like, we're very, very responsible drug users. So <laughs> yeah, there was, there was none of that for me. It was just like, oh, what else we could do? Uh, yeah, I was like, was like, like I wasn't. I was just an idiot in the day. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, no, we're overheating. We're hot. We're sweating a lot. We, okay, we gotta hide. We're in Bangkok. It's hot here. No. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, on that note, Mara, I'm gonna let I'll let you go. I think it's been almost two hours, or at least an hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's going on for two hours. I think I think we need to wrap this up, man. You know what I mean? And, and I'll let you get to bed and chill out. So uh, it's been, it's been wicked talking to you, Will. I can't wait to meet up with yeah, you again, mate. Yeah, so definitely, that, bro. Definitely, we'll keep we'll definitely keep in touch. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, you'll get to come and fight in China and where, wherever you are in China. If I'm there, I'll I'll, I'll come I'll come and see you, man. And uh, when I get definitely, back to bro. Bangkok, I'll come and see. You. So uh, thanks very much. I really appreciate it, mate. Take care and good luck yeah. on. Yes, sir. When is it you yeah, have, a, have a good night. 23rd, 20... uh, So I'm fighting Ju July 24th uh, in Tampa and Florida. It's going to be for BKFC, Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship. Pause right uh, at that time. Bare Knuckle Boxing. So, yeah. July, uh, sorry. I'll give everybody the July 24th. I'll, I'll make sure I post up on my, okay. on my social medias and stuff so people can find out what the pay-per-view link or the link or whatever it is so people right. can watch. Good luck for that. And, and thanks Pretty very much. Well. Really appreciate it, mate. Yeah, thanks, Peace out, man. man. We'll, we'll talk again soon. Cheers.